Hai. Halo. Hey. Hello. Yes, we are live. Greetings, comrade. Yes. Oh, Simba, are you with us? Hold on one second. I'm going to be introducing shit to my audience and going live, okay? Um, okay. So I'm going to do that now. Um, sure, do your thing. Oh, Simba, you're with us. Can you unmute? Are you, uh... Hmm? Can't hear Simba. Are you with us? Uh, I'm here. <coughs> Hello, friends! You are live on Trekkie69's channel, and also... I guess I'm live on Melodies. Hello, Melodies chat. Hello and welcome, everyone. Um, Hi. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, part 10 of our discussion of uh, the German Revolution uh, by Pierre Bruet. Uh, we covered chapters. Uh, 31 through 34 last time, uh, and today we're going to be covering chapters uh, 35 through 38. Um, oh, hello everyone in the chat. Hello, Eve. Um, and uh, so yeah, I, I thought we'd just kind of get started like we usually do today, and oh, Simba's going to be a minute, but I figure while we're okay. waiting for them, we can just uh, go around and do um, names, uh, pronouns, uh, what you do on uh, on the internet or real life or whatever you prefer. Um, and uh, um, Maybe, yeah, just a quick sentence or two about why you think uh, studying the German Revolution is important for uh, socialists today. Uh, since Trekkie is my special guest today, I, <coughs> I am going to let them introduce themselves first, and then we will uh, go around, and then we will uh, get going with our usual proceedings. Um, and unfortunately, we are uh, missing uh, our dear friend Labor Kyle today. He uh, had uh, some stuff going on that came up at the last second, so he will hopefully be back with us uh, two weeks from now uh, at our usual time, uh, as will our good friend of the show, Professor Axel Faschultz, uh, Associate Professor of History at SUNY Potsdam, who's been coming on and helping us talk about this uh, difficult book um anyhow so uh yeah i'll just hand things over to to trekkie and get our introductions going here hello i am trekkie 69 uh they them are the pronouns uh for those who don't know me i am a twitch streamer uh i'm neuro but uh i am neurodivergent i'm non-binary and i'm jewish and i'm an anarchist um i do Twitch streams about lots of things with a common theme of anarchism, good, capitalism, bad. Uh, I think studying the German Revolution is important because it's the same reason that all history is important. We need to study it, mine it for tactics, uh, find out what did work and didn't work, and apply it as best uh, we can you know, to our current uh, material conditions. All right. Uh, Izzy or Simba, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Izzy. Uh, I make shit posts. Uh, 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 
loud yelly GoPro videos, and uh, occasionally I uh, make something thoughtful and intelligent, and I appear on streams. Um, uh, my pronouns are she, they, and uh, I think studying the German Revolution is pretty important uh, for pretty much exactly the same reasons that Tracky said. All right. Simba, you want to? Yeah. Hey, uh, there. I uh, can't really hear you, comrade. Sorry. Oh. Oh, you can, you're very you're very quiet. We can hear you, but you're very quiet. Mm. All right. Can you hear me now? Barely. Barely. Yeah. Mm, nope, still not coming through real well. Like, hmm. oh, I have had those days. Yeah, yeah. Oh dear. Not sure what to do, but I mean, you could turn me up unless you can. Yeah, I just did. I turned you up to max, so uh, yeah. we can uh, we can on my end we can hear you. Uh, yeah, I don't know if, I, like, my, if my chat can hear you. I'm not sure. Um, oh, well, can, my chat can hear here, Simba. I just boosted your I volume. Can hear Simba. Here, can you, uh, Simba? I just turned your volume up. Can you try again? Yeah, hello, hello. I'm so Oh my gosh. That's me? barely better. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm so sorry. Uh oh shit. Now I got this all. Ah, how do I recenter it? God damn it. <laughs> I hate this. I'm such a boomer. <laughs> what, what am I? Ah. Uh, Uh, oh man, how do I get? This? I'm adjusting everyone. I'm adjusting everyone's volume for Simba. <laughs> I'm, so I'm doing my best here. <laughs> sorry. It's fine. Uh, oh, there we go. It is what I fixed it is, it. you know. This is peak um, content. All right. Well, uh, just uh, I don't know. Speak into the mic loudly. <laughs> we'll fix it. Yeah, just yell. Okay. Uh, hello, hello. Can you kind of hear me? Maybe a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. As a treat. <laughs> exactly. We'll just have to be really quiet so we can hear Comrade Simba. Okay. All right. Well, hey, I'm Simba. Um say them and uh sorry for being quiet i'm known for having horrible technical difficulties and maybe i'll dive into my settings after this and find you know the button that makes me super loud uh but uh we should study the german revolution because it's a, a revolution in like the the very formative years uh a tumultuous time right after world war one uh and you know, the, the entire world would be completely different uh, if Germany's uh, revolution was won. Unfortunately, it was lost. The product of that was um, a political and economic uh, situation that was ripe for fascism to, to lay hold for the next 20 years or so. Uh, and, and we have plenty to learn from just that. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, according to my chat, you're coming through okay, so maybe it's actually something on my end, but I don't know. Um, so yeah, we're. Uh, I guess I can get things started. Um, I'm uh, Melody. This is my channel, uh, A World to Win. I use she/her pronouns. Uh, use my channel to talk about um, history and political theory from a Marxist perspective, um, and we do these. Uh, streams on the German Revolution every two weeks uh, so that uh, we can learn the lessons of uh, of it and uh, 
this book, this particular book is, is very authoritative. It's very extensive. It's uh, also intensive. It's very, uh, you know, deep. It's about 912 pages uh, and it is not an easy read. So we are working through it together. Um, so uh, yeah, we will uh, <laughs> just always qualifying that none of us here are experts on this topic. Um, our comrade Trekkie here is a uh, history grad student, uh, and our my my our usual uh, co-host uh, Labor Kyle is also a history grad student. But uh, it's it's a mix here. We've got folks who have uh, are very formally educated, and folks who who, who are uh, less formally educated. It's it's you know pedagogy. The mode of teaching here is very much like. You know, we read through this difficult book and we work through it together so that everyone can gain a better understanding of it. Um, and yeah, so um, oh, I, did I already say I use she, her pronouns? Um, I forgot. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a mess here. I last night was um, pretty rough for folks in Portland over here. Um, which I don't actually want to get into on the mm. stream. So I'm just going to start our uh, summary with, uh, we left off last time with uh, actually tra the chapter that Trekkie last uh, summarized called The Development of the Tactic, that is the United Front Tactic of um, basically uh, com the Communist Party forming uh, on a very kind of provisional basis uh, governments with the social democrats uh in the interest of um you know being a united front against uh you know the fascists and and the capitalists um and this incredibly uh tur turbulent period um so we're going to start off today with a uh, chapter um 30 Five, which is uh, called the occupation of the Ruhr. Uh, and so basically, what happens is that uh, as party, as part of the um, conditions of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, which was uh, a treaty that was uh, signed at the conclusion of World War One, uh, one of the things that it did was. Um, uh, basically pass off the war debt onto Germany and was like, hey, your fault, <laughs> pay up. Uh, and it uh, does not, it, it uh, took away a lot of Germany's actual resources that they would have had to produce the, to, to, to pay down that debt. So it was kind of a double trap for them. Uh, and as part of kind of the allies wanting to enforce that in um, January of 1923, the French uh, occupy uh, the, uh, the, the region called the Ruhr. Um, yeah, and uh, so in May of 1921, uh, the debt was... Um, uh, 132 billion marks. Yeah, the debt was fixed at uh, 132 billion marks uh, in fixed e yearly payments of 2 billion marks uh, and increased by a scale of up to 26% of German exports. Um, so it was incredibly onerous and the German capitalists would basically say, oh, I know, what's a great idea? Let's print a bunch of money and pass off this on the working class because that always goes so well. Um, yeah, so the French Poincaré government orders the uh, unpopular, uh, it's unpopular all across Europe, the occupation, uh, orders it to, quote, seize a productive security. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles really had little concern for Germany's future. It was a pretty transparent looting operation on the part of the Allies. Um, on the 13th of January, uh, the Reichstag passes a resolution of 
passive resistance to the French Belgian occupation. Um, this is with, I think, the Social Democrats in majority. Uh, the 29th of January, the occupation government declares martial law and extends the occupation in uh, all the way to the edge of the Dutch border. Um, needless to say, having uh, the French occupy a huge industrial region within the country uh, inflamed uh, nationalism severely, and we're going to be getting into that. Uh, especially in Trekkie's chapter uh, with the rise of uh, the emergence of the Nazi party. Oh, yeah, there's still uh, obvious, I probably should have opened with this, uh, a bit of a content warning that we are going to be talking about Nazis a lot, and uh, well, at least a fair bit during this stream. And... Uh, <laughs> Is it a coincidence that two of us, two are, of us Jewish? are Jewish? I think not. <laughs> two of us are. We got um, plenty of people who who the Nazis would not have smiled upon in our stream here <laughs> for various reasons. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd fare much better off. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, certainly just, not. Uh, um, sorry, I just need uh, um like thirty seconds to talk with my chat. Oh please. Um. Yeah, so all right. Um and it's worth Hello, oh, thank you, I'm back. All right. <laughs> uh so it's also worth remembering that in nineteen twenty two, I believe, the uh uh I can't remember the exact Italian words and I'm gonna mispronounce them anyway, the partito national fascista or whatever it's called uh the pnf the fascist party in italy seizes power i believe in 1922 uh so fascism is established as like a very real threat and it's like taking on like overtly anti-communist um anti-working class uh uh flavor uh kind of from the very get-go uh, the KPD wants absolutely nothing to do with the, um, kind of the, they're, 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 they're really kind of have this muddled policy towards the occupation because they saw it as like basically a repeat of the war vote in, during World War I. Um, their goal was to deter the working class and the Roar from nationalism. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, uh, they're trying to kind of thread the needle of uh, not wanting to get imperialized by the French, but also not siding with the German bourgeoisie, which, uh, and this was further complicated by the relationship of the Soviet Union to Germany during this time. Um, and basically Moscow's directives to the KPD uh, also complicate matters um, in this period. Um, working class resistance in the Roo was met with absolutely brutal repression from the French occupying, French Belgian occupying forces. Um, and as a result of kind of a variety of factors. The workers of the Rho were um, isolated from their French comrades, and despite uh, the, uh, their best efforts, um, and this would kind of lay. This would be one of the bases for the conditions that would uh, cause the KPD to start uh, fraying again. There's a lot of that you'll notice throughout kind of all of our streams. The KPD likes to. Um, Likes to likes to split a lot or almost split, um, and it's kind of it's kind of like a, I hate to put it so flippantly, but like this whole time we've been reading this, I've just been thinking to myself like, this is such a soap opera. It's like a like a like a will they won't they break up <laughs> thing. Like, <laughs> I don't want to put it, it so is. so casually, but um, but. Yeah, and sometimes the like sometimes the reasons for the split or almost split seems very like serious and reasonable, and sometimes it's just like, what, what are you, 
what are you children squabbling about? This is nonsense. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so this is a, a quote uh, from page 693. The Battle of the Ruhr was presented as a conflict between the bourgeoisies on the backs of the German working class uh, by the KPD. So, as I said, this position was very hard to maintain. Uh, according to Ernst Talheimer, uh, the German bourgeoisie in its resistance was, quote, playing objectively an objectively revolutionary role against its own will. Um, and this is kind of regarded as a hot take in the party. Uh, it makes a lot of people very upset. Um, and yeah, that's where we get to chapter th uh, 36, which is, I believe Simba. Or is that your chapter? Sorry. Uh, yes, chapter 36 is my chapter. All right. Um, so according to chat, you're still pretty quiet, but... Um, yeah, right, right. Uh, is this, like, workable, though? Like, is it okay? Uh, I'm doing my best, I swear. Uh, I don't know. Like, I was I was looking through my settings, and, like, there's nothing that's significant. All right. I guess we'll I can... just... I mean, I can hear you fine, but that's because I turned my own internal volume all the way up and yours all the way up, and everyone else is including my own down. <laughs> all right. So, so at least on my end, you can be heard. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, yeah, we'll just we'll just be real quiet. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, yeah, that, and I'll make all of my responses pretty short, including the, the summary. Um, so, we ready? Uh, yeah. So, chapter 36, uh, which is entitled A Crisis in the KPD. So, uh, this chapter starts January 1923, when the social democratic government in Saxony kind of, like, fell through. Um, it was sort of like overthrown kind of uh but but it was it was much more like people would get like really really rowdy unless the government uh steps down and like change some stuff uh sort of like we saw in minneapolis recently i guess um so the left-wing uh elements of the sdp at the at the particular time in, in uh saxony were pretty sympathetic to the kpd and like communists more generally and left-wing elements saw this falling through of the SDP in Saxony as kind of a, an opportunity. Uh, so especially because if the KPD successfully formed a government with the SDP, then left-wing elements uh, in general would be a majority in the parliament, uh, in the Landtag, not the Reichstag, but the Landtag. Um, the KPD quickly organized workers and people's assemblies uh, in order to hear their opinions and talk about whether or not uh, joining with the SDP in a co uh, coalition government was okay and like if people would be cool with it. And uh, the KPD was very popular with most people attending, even those who were not communists themselves. Uh, members of the KPD also attended the SDP's meetings, often asking if they would, uh, if they could air their own grievances and talk about their program. Uh, two days before a special meeting where both the SDP and the KPD uh, met, the red flag, uh, Die Rote Fahne, you know, the newspaper, uh, posted the program, which had radical solutions to a whole lot of problems, uh, posted their program in the, in the paper, uh, which included, but was not limited to, confiscation of the monarchy's uh, property without compensation, uh, arming the workers, a purge of the judiciary, which at the time was very corrupt, uh, the, like, purging the police and administration, uh, severe measures against counter-revolutionary organizations, called on uh, the factory councils, uh, extension of the rights of those councils, confiscation of idle factories, uh, forced loans, and uh, price controls by elected committees. Like so, so regular KPD stuff. And even the uh, left-wing social democrats were like hang on like factory councils like that's not cool and they explicitly called it actually uh the sovietization of saxony 
still though, the KPD didn't want to burn any bridges and gracefully failed and withdrew their demands, kind of accepted the fact there was still going to be a single party government in the Landtag in Saxony and uh, said that the, the KPD uh, issued an official statement saying that they would support a single party government to the exclusion of the right wing elements of leadership, including Buck, who is the Landtag kind of like governor, so to speak. So the crisis uh, was more or less about around whether or not joining the SDP was like a good idea. Uh, at the end of the day, it didn't really matter because they didn't have to do that. Uh, but most of the party was like, look, like even their left wing is, is like a bunch of like nationalists and, you know, they're awful and stuff. Uh, and but people like Carl Raddick were like, no, this was an awesome opportunity. We got out there, like we talked about our program, and it was very popular with people who themselves were not communists. Uh, so it was it was worth like giving it a shot and stuff. Uh, but then there were putschist uh, elements or putschist, I'm not sure how to pronounce that word, like Fisher, who were like, look, we should just gather up the, the left wing elements like right now and over like the next few months, like gather enough people to like march into Berlin and like take that down, you know, like take take down Berlin. Um, and obviously that's not cool. <laughs> and everybody else was like, what are you talking about? You know, that's obviously an adventurous move. So that's kind of where the chapter leaves off. All right, thank you. Um, uh, so usually how this works is we get through, um, we go through all four of our summaries and then we have some time to, to discuss. Um, so uh, we, could, we could always leave a little extra breathing room, but I think Maybe today, uh, especially considering that uh, your dear host is uh, kind of tired and not feeling super great, I think we should probably just kind of uh, get through the summaries and get to discussion. Um, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to advocate for that. Um, kind of also apologize for the uh, <laughs> incoherent babbling going on on my end because I really did not sleep that well um, no it's per it's perfectly fine i can uh i can try to you know hurry myself uh or i can try to you know speed through it a well, bit more yeah i don't feel obligated to like speed but you know i i was just anyway okay yeah i mean i take pretty general notes any for the most part anyway right. so um yeah, so uh, now we're uh, fast-forwarding to uh, the year of 1923 um, due, to, uh, due to the ongoing occupation of the Ruhr and the fact that, um, and the fact that you know, things like uh, the Reichsbank were uh, getting all unstable and they couldn't pay the repar Germany couldn't pay the reparations because the government wasn't willing to tax the rich fuckers. Um, <laughs> uh, massive, you know, the, the whole trope with the Weimar Republic of massive inflation, that's really, you know, when it started, where, you know, p people were literally, you know, like exchanging barrelfuls of, mo uh, of money for like basic necessities. Um, I'm putting the chart up on screen right now. Oh. The inflation um, chart. I'm going to see if it'll show up. Okay, well, I'm not going to show it, but I'm going to give a link to your stream. So, chat, if you want to see that, um... Yeah, it is, it is going to be on my stream. Yeah, see, see what I'm doing? I'm trying to do the cross-pollination, you know? It's good. It's good. Uh, yeah, so, uh, here we have the chart real quick. I was just going to do, it like, a quick summary. Sorry to interrupt. But no, um, that's as you can see here in uh, April of 1922, uh, I'm going to be flipping back and forth between the chart and the and the tab uh, table. So in 1922, uh, April, uh, the Deutschmark, uh, one dollar is equal to 1000 uh, Deutschmarks. Uh, and you can't really see it on this graph because it's so 
um, because the period from April of 1922 to July of 1923 is so minuscule compared to what happens after you know, during the month of July here. Um, so uh, by October, it's uh, 2,000 Deutschmarks to a dollar. By uh, January of 1923, it's 8,000 Deutschmarks to a dollar. Uh, and then right here in uh, late July, it reaches 1 million Deutschmarks per dollar. That's this here, uh, where I'm kind of pointing to on the graph as at that point where it crosses the 1 million mark. Uh, oh, excuse me. No, that's also wrong. That's 100 million. <laughs> um, this <laughs> little inflection point here at the bottom is where it hits, uh, I think, 46 million Deutschmarks per dollar. And then by September of 1923, right up here, um, the, uh, it's 325 million Deutschmarks per dollar. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yes, um, that, is, that is a word for it. It is what we in the profession of economics call uh, fucked. That's uh is that sorry, what uh time period is this over? Uh this is from nineteen twenty two to twenty three. I am going to post a link in the chat to that chart. Uh the data that I got that from is actually in the Bruet book. Um but Bruet does this thing that just absolutely drives me bananas, which is he doesn't tabulate any of his figures. <laughs> Um, doesn't put them into into table form, and I'm I'm a woman of science, and it just drives me up the goddamn wall. Um, oh, well, as someone uh, as someone who um, learns via uh, or reads via audiobook, or in this case, ebook turned into audiobook, it actually really doesn't matter to me. But I could totally see how that was annoying. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, if you if you want to see that chart in detail, I just put a link to it in my chat. Um, yeah, Nightmare Alpha is absolutely correct. Uh, I can't remember there's where he says it in the chapter. It's somewhere in, towards the end of that section where he's talking about inflation. I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, and then, sorry, Trekkie, we'll get back to your summary. That's fine. Um, where is it? Middle of that. Actually, Trekkie, why don't you go ahead and continue, and I will find I'll find it. And no problem. Um, so that was causing you know a shit ton of uh, a shit ton of uh, bad stuff. Um, essentially, uh. The uh, bourgeoisie, like you do, became extremely opportunistic and profited greatly by, you know, buying up failing businesses and, you know, firing all the workers and doing all that usual economic fuckery they do. Um, and this was preying on a lot of economic anxieties, the worst of like the petty bourgeoisie of, you know, the, the people who made most of their money off of like, you know, investments and uh, and speculation and that was driving them further and further to the right uh, a lot of you know the nsdap uh recruits during then were um you know petty bourgeois types but the communists also tried and to varying degrees did seem to succeed to uh appeal to those people also uh but like it was a, a growing thing that uh the party, uh, the party recognized early on. Um, another thing that was driving, uh, you know, the petty bourgeois towards, you know, both the far left and the far right was the weakening of the SPD's, you know, control on, uh, on, you know, left politics in Germany, like, uh, um, it, which was like you know like a huge thing because uh 
the Communist Party was relatively new and the Social Dems had for decades been the quote-unquote socialist party in Germany. Um, and so also a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, newspapers went out of print because of, uh, because of the inflation and its economic effects because, you know, they could no longer afford paper and ink and all that stuff. And that happened, unfortunately, to a lot of uh, communist and socialist newspapers. Uh, let's see what else. Um, oh, uh, this radicalized people, uh, also in the reformist unions that the SPD, uh, had a stranglehold over, um, communists, uh, held the majority in, um, or, uh, Oh, uh, the specific note, the uh, membership of the KPD in reformist unions, such as uh, the metal workers union, equaled the membership of, you know, the more uh, reformist uh, minded union members. And um, in the factory councils that had been set up as a result of the revolutions in like 1918, 1919, uh, communists uh, held uh, the majority, uh, the majority in over 2000 of them. Uh, so back to, uh, back to the Nazis, uh, the Nazis, uh, had started, um, their own, you know, armed military group, uh, it, by the end of 1922, the NSDAP had 15,000 members and it's militia, uh, the SA, I don't know what the SA stands for, had 6,000 members. And so, um, and so in response to that, um, as well as, um, in response to the occupation, uh, by the Entente, specifically the French of the Roar, uh, by the way, am I pronouncing that correctly? I have, I have no, no idea. idea. <laughs> um, uh, I workers, Russian, uh, not German. <laughs> yeah, uh, yo hablo español, pero no, uh, la idioma de alemán. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, in response to the occupation of the Ruhr and the rise of fascists, a lot of uh, workers, self-defense uh, groups got together, and the KPD kind of like formalized their relationship with them, uh, and they formed what were called the Proletarian Hundreds, which were literally just like everyday citizens, like fucking arming up and getting ready to, to you know, fight fascists and, uh, and do a guerrilla occupation against the French imperialists. It was, they, they were pretty based. Um, however, um, uh, Nazis were, uh, were also gaining some traction, not much, but some traction in factory councils. And uh, KPD member Carl Becker uh, pointed out that you can't just arm the proletariat to uh, counter Nazism. Uh, you need to point out um, that... Uh, only the German proletariat uh, and, you know, the German communist pro uh, proletariat in specific could uh, defend against the uh, the occupation of the Ruhr by the French. You know, the state couldn't do that. You know, these uh, these, um, you know, these these fascists that are, you know, the N NSDAP, they they couldn't protect you because, you know, they're in line with the bourgeoisie. Um and Clara Zetkin at this time, uh, also uh, old uh, Clara Zetkin, uh, awesome person, KPD member, uh, hugely uh, influential um, socialist feminist in the early 20th century. Uh, she anti um, amazing. Anti yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, she basically said uh, that uh, fascism is using uh, socialist or proletarian language for bourgeois ends. And this is in 1923. Like, y you know, we have decades of, you know, analyzing fascism and stuff like that. And she was like, n she was literally like analyzing that shit as it was happening. Um, anyways, I'm putting a link to her um, in the chat, by the way. Yeah. Um, it's a great also, writing. yeah. Also, they, um, the communists actually tried and in a lot of cases succeeded in kind of like debating and talking with, uh, with Nazis. And apparently a lot of their audiences were very enthusi uh, enthusiastic. And so the Nazis were the ones who squashed the frozen peaches. Um, and, but that also kind of, you know, led into a bit of an in, uh, internal, uh, internal debate over, you know, how much should we, you know, be going with these fascists? You know, they are... 
you know, far right reactionary dickheads. Um, and yeah, uh, that's where my notes left off. Uh, so yeah. That's good. Um, Izzy, are you yeah. ready for your uh, summary? Yeah. yeah, let me put my glasses back on. Okay. okay. So, um, after the roar, um, things pretty much began to snowball. Like, the mark collapsed. That was already covered. Like, a bunch of strikes popped off without, like, union or uh, uh, stock uh, government approval. Who, um, who warned they would only increase communist influence. They were right. Um, factory counselors were beginning to uh, become bigger players in the labor scene. Uh, the uh, All Right Action Committee, uh, committee uh, oh, their All Right Action Committee, uh, the Committee of 15, uh, presided over by, sorry, my writing is sometimes very bad. This um, is why I type. Because um, my writing is horrible. Huh? Herman Grotha, I think. Um, anyway, it uh, started to look like an alternative working class leadership structure. Um, on, six, on the 16th of June, the committee addressed, uh, in, the name of in the name of the factory councils, an appeal to the working people, civil servants, clerical workers, and intellectuals. It told of a catastrophic future for Germany and assured that the wor working class could take down the capitalist system. And a shared struggle. Um, only common struggle. Only common struggle. Only class struggle can bring you what you need simply to survive. The working people are in motion in the flood which the trade unions are today trying to stem and halt. Important uh, important tasks fall to the factory councils. The committee called for factory uh, for factory councils to set up local and regional organizations to provide, uh, provide objectives and leadership, price control committees, uh, and uh, proletarian hundreds with this space um, would uh, would be uh, organized accordingly to this principle and with factory councils would form the basis of workers' government. Ooh. Um, Ooh, indeed. Yeah. Strikes broke out in uh, Boston on uh, uh, June 2nd and in Dresden and uh, uh, Leipzig on the 7th. On the same day, 100,000 miners and metal workers were on strike uh, in Upper uh, Silesia. Uh, the strike committee had six communists in its leadership. On the 11th, 100,000 agricultural workers went on strike in uh, Silesia, which was unprecedented, along with uh, 10,000 day laborers in Brandenburg. A strike also began in the Mercantile Marine in Emden, Bremen, and Hamburg. And uh, Lubeck, uh, called for by the Siemens Federation, which was under communist leadership. In Berlin, metal workers went to action, 250,000 in the capital and suburbs, of which 153 were in the trade unions. Or 153,000, sorry. Uh, worker pressure forced the union uh, to call a strike ballot. Results were overwhelmingly in uh, favor of uh, the let's fucking go camp. The second ballot included non-members and was even more in favor. In the end, a strike call went to the largest firms compromising collective workforce to 90,000. Negotiations opened immediately, but on July 10th, 150,000 were on strike. Um, the same day, employers signed for a wage increase, 9,800 marks for the end of last, the last week of June to 12,000 for the first week of July. Uh, one clause laid out the formation of a price index to allow for adjustment in according uh, with inflation. Employers wanted this kept secret, obviously. Um, the results were quite visible, though. Uh, the building trade, then the woodworkers, uh, had to go at the Capitol not too long after. On the 12th of July, the explosion of economic strikes prompted a uh, 
Dorota Fun uh, to publish a call to the party uh, drafted entirely uh, by Brandler. It had been um, it had been expected on the 11th by a particularly surprised Zendrala. Um, Randler was uh, alarmed by the progress of reactionary elements in the country and uh, none too happy to hear of Wolfheim, a former leftist who had defected just so he could like meme about icing some pinkos. He actually did the whole like shoot the communist bit. Um, yeah, he actually said that. Uh, to the appeal, uh, the appeal basically said that uh, the you know, government, anyway, was about to collapse and the shit would uh, get incredibly real incredibly fast. The French and Belgians, of course it's them, were um, promoting a separatist movement in the Rhineland and uh, Bavaria, uh, in, in the Rhineland and Bavaria was ready to secede and just go bonkers with the fascist nonsense. Um, Nazis, true to form, were preparing for civil war. It would be after the harvest against uh, workers, uh, workers in Saxony and uh, Thuringia, where uh, Sockdems were, surprisingly enough, uh, allowing it to occur so they wouldn't have to fight the communists themselves. Um, but much like any shit show, it was unscheduled as of yet with any interested parties and uh, was presumed to just be inevitable at some point. The idea was to uh, rope in non-party uh, people and uh, uh, Sockdens into this so they wouldn't be so colossally fucked, so they all wouldn't be so colossally fucked over. Um, it, it didn't end up working like that, but you know, empty promises. The uh, same issue, um, hold on, I, I did not space any of this. Um, it's all good. All right, the same issue announced a declaration of uh, uh, July 29th as Anti-Fascist Day, also based. Was that your whole summary? Oh, I wasn't sure if I was the only one who uh, who couldn't uh, <laughs> who couldn't hear uh, Comrade Izzy. Izzy, you're still with us. We wish to hear your beautiful voice. <laughs> All right. Uh well, hopefully she will uh, reconnect soon. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Izzy, we can't just say no. We can't hear you. Um, hopefully, your uh, that'll be fixed soon. Um, but anyway, I just want to kind of keep things smooth and uh, going. So uh, let's uh, let's have some discussion here. Like, um, I'll, of course, also folks in the chat, uh, my chat at least. There's only five people there, but there's. I think forty something people watching on Trekkies. Yeah, uh, Chud Logic there. was beautiful and gave me a raid. Oh, well, thank you, Chud Logic. Um, that's awesome. We're glad to have so many. People oh, I watching. should should probably give a link to Melody's uh, stream. Yes, please so do. anyone anyone in my chat, uh, please do the double tap maneuver where you give both of uh, the hosts uh, your lovely eyeballs because it helps in the algorithm. Yes, yes, that would be really lovely, folks. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, would you mind if um, everyone here introduced themselves quickly, since we have so many new viewers on my end, and then you can chill for yourselves? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, just real quick. I am um, Melody. This is my channel, uh, A World to Win, where I talk about um, politics and, and history from kind of a Marxist uh, Leninist perspective. Uh, and we, I hold these um, study, basically a public study group here uh, with my comrades every two weeks or so uh, talking about, uh, well, right now we're working our way through a book uh, called The German Revolution uh, by Pierre Brouet. Um, 
and but we'll do probably other texts in the future. Um, and yeah, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I think I'm getting guess starting to get real rambly. So yeah, everyone else can go ahead and reintroduce themselves. Hey Simba, you can go ahead. Okay, I was nervous about whether or not I should go first. Hi, I'm Simba. I know I'm known for uh, having te technical difficulties, being quiet, and uh, um, very loud and dumb on the internet. I guess uh, YouTube channel Young Simba, uh, Twitter same thing. Yo, it's Simba actually, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Oh, and um, Izzy, uh, you there? But um, by the way, my chat, uh, I have it on followers only mode, but you can talk immediately once you're follow, because I wanted to encourage people to follow, but I don't, you know, want people to have to wait 10 minutes in order to chat. Um, anyway, uh, Izzy, uh, yeah, you I, still having technical issues? I think that's probably safe to say. My oh. my thing, my uh, Discord shows it as uh, her volume being like all the way on or something. I'm not sure. Like it's the yeah. you know how your uh, frame lights up green when you're, whenever you're talking, right? Oh so hers yeah, is, hers is lit up like that. So. I presume something's maybe wrong with her mic setup. I don't know. Um, More than the yeah. Don't know, so. But anyway, um, so uh, for folks joining us from Chud Logic's uh, raid, we are discussing chapters 35 through 38 of the German Revolution by Pierre Bruet. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and we just got through our summaries of the chapters. So we are going to now start our discussion, which I like to keep pretty free form, uh, just kind of like, uh, you know, we can kind of post questions as to like maybe things that we found confusing or, uh, or interesting or uh, amusing or whatever. Um, and, you know, we like to keep things current. So, uh, you know, reading history and theory for its own sake is, uh, you know, just intellectual masturbation. Uh, and as much, <laughs> as much as we all like to get ourselves off, um, <laughs> uh, without, you know, kind of applying what we learn from, uh, from reading history and political theory into, uh, our political practice today, um, you know, uh, it's, it's just wankery. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's make sure to, to be asking those questions that are also going to be uh, you know, recontextualizing this revolution into uh, kind of our, our present moment in various ways, uh, right? You can't draw uh, whatever parallels you want because, you know, times have changed a lot, but there's a lot of things that haven't changed. So, um, you know, uh, anyhow, that's just kind of the general outline of how I like to run our discussions here. So uh, I will go ahead and uh, hand the floor back over to my co-hosts here and you all can um kind of get things uh going maybe i don't know i was thinking that uh yeah again i'm still kind of frazzled from my sleepless night but um uh, i guess i found i just my the real highlight of this reading for me was uh uh, reading about the hyperinflation of 1922 and 1923, uh, I did my one of my undergraduate degrees is in economics, and I just like am morbidly fascinated by this period in terms of like economic um, fuckery carried on by imperialist powers, um, and one of the like big um texts that i read during my undergrad in economics was uh the economic consequences of the peace by jane uh john maynard keynes 
Who, Ew, um, liberal alert. Yes, I will make that joke on stream. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> as I was discussing with Trekkie earlier, um, you know, I don't obviously endorse Keynes as a, in terms of like policy, he's, you know, an imperialist and kind of a liberal slash so dumb, but like he was really astute in his economic analysis. And I'd say like, almost on par with Marx in terms of his his power of, um, you know, being able to analyze macroeconomic um, phenomenon. Um, and it's especially evident in this little uh, book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which I will thumb through and try to find uh, good excerpts from while my uh, other co-hosts uh, discuss here. So I will hand things over to you guys now. Yeah, I mean, even though he's a liberal, his... Uh... Keynes, like, economic, you know, entire economic, like, library of information that he put out there, all his research, inspired, like, 70 years of economic policy in practically every continent and stuff, so. Mm -hmm. so uh -huh. Absolutely. Against. <clears throat> oh, yeah, it inspired things like, Bre uh, like the Bretton Woods Conference uh social democratic policies um it yeah like again i agree with melody uh next to next to marx in terms of you know the classic uh classics in economic thoughts like das kapital uh and uh for me um fuck i forget the name it's keynes's most f on like money yeah interest. it's called the general theory of money employment and interest which I think is very useful, especially if you're going to look at um, how, uh, it, you know, why is the government spending trillions of dollars right now, even though they're actually not doing it the way they're supposed to do? Keynes advocated for employing the populace via infrastructure programs, not giving massive corporate bailouts and giving uh, $1,200 a month if you, uh, if you, um, uh, means tested into it as a treat. Yes. And, uh, uh move. he, he was not a neoliberal. No, but, um, he Eisenhower, was not president Eisenhower, uh, inf infamously, uh, warned against, uh, the so-called military industrial complex, which has also been termed, and I don't necessarily endorse this terminology because I think there's some problems with it, but uh, it's been called, so, like, the military-industrial complex um, has sometimes been referred to as, like, military, like, military, Keynesian. Keynesian. yeah, military Keynesianism, which, again, I think is deceptive terminology, but uh, it's just kind of one of those things. If people use it, um, you know, it's good to know. Um, anyhow carry on yeah oh shit back to uh, uh oh simba you were gonna say something i was just oh. gonna say super fast that like i don't even know that much about cans outside of uh you know the maybe 11 pages of like history that he has to do with or whatever that i read in some other book but like yeah that that terminology is very not <laughs> problematic i guess to say the least yeah anyways sorry i got us off topic um oh i guess um oh, hopefully it will be yeah hopefully they'll be um uh hopefully they'll be back um anyways uh did uh oh we were talking about Keynes because you were talking about um his analysis of uh the the um result of the versailles treaty yeah. oh and by the way Which uh I'm part of the reason right now yeah by the way uh fun fact part of the reason why the nazis had a so-called economic miracle is because the allies started easing up uh, or on the former entente powers started easing up on the required payments and the united states uh put out a ton of loans to both Weimar and uh, uh, and the uh, you know uh, Nazi regime. Oh, Izzy, are you back with us? Kick. Yeah, we've got Izzy I... back. Woo! Yeah, my internet went out and I did not notice, so I had to switch to my phone. Oh, okay. Well, we were just talking. yeah. It just 
Yeah, because I was just kind of like reading through my notes and wondering why nobody was like saying anything. And then uh, all of a sudden I looked up and the internet was gone. So. (laughs) All right. Well, we're just talking about kind of the the Versailles Treaty and its uh, economic fallout that it caused in Germany and kind of how it set the conditions for the rise it it contributed to the rising nationalism that we read about in this uh chapter sec chapter selection oh yeah uh definitely um yeah there's a whole lot of infighting that happens in my chapter <laughs> yep like for real though it's like it's almost as bad as like twitter um, because then at least they can drop shit in. but it's whatever um anyway where was I going with that oh yeah I guess I'd better start right oh right we need to uh well, you, you were doing your chapter summary oh yeah, shit then, yeah <laughs> I almost forgot I'm so sorry <laughs> thanks for calling me no. out Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think you had God. actually started your chapter summary a little bit, um, and then you got disconnected. Yeah, I was so... probably not too far in because, okay. like, it got really quiet. All right. Like, well, you you start wherever you want to start, then. Okay. Um, and okay. I need I need to check something over here on my end, so I'm going to mute myself and. Uh, excuse myself for just a moment. So, Izzy, you go ahead and uh, start up your chapter summary, dear. Okay. So, after the roar, things pretty much began to snowball. Uh, as uh, Tracky mentioned in their, in their summary, like, inflation became kind of a big fucking deal. Um, uh, strikes popped off without union or SOCDEM government approval, uh, and they were both uh, pretty pretty, pretty worried that that would increase communist influence. Um, Factory councils were beginning to become a bigger player in uh, the labor scene. The, their all right action committee, the uh, committee of 15, presided over by Herman Grotha, uh, it started to look like an alternative for working class leadership. On the 16th of June, the committee addressed in the name of the factory councils an appeal to the working people, civil servants, clerical workers, and intellectuals. It told of a catastrophic future for Germany and assured that the working class could take down the capitalist system. Only common struggle, only class struggle, can bring you what you need simply to survive. The working people are in motion in the flood which the trade unions are today trying to stem and halt important tasks fall to the factory councils. The committee called for factory councils to set up local and regional organizations to provide objectives and leadership. Price control committees and and the proletarian hundreds would be uh, organized according to this proposal and with factory councils, uh, and, and the factory councils would, uh, or and with the factory councils, I forgot a word there and it tripped my whole thing up, <laughs> uh, would uh, form the basis of a worker's government. Ooh, woo. Ooh, woo. Yeah. I, okay. Now I remember where, where I got disconnected at. Anyway, strikes broke out in Botzen on uh, June the 2nd and in Dresden and uh, Leipzig on the 7th. Uh, on the same day, 100,000 miners and metal workers were on strike in Upper Silesia. Uh, the strike committee had six communists in its leadership. On the 11th, 100,000 agricultural workers went on strike in uh, Silesia, which was unprecedented, along with 10,000 day laborers in Brandenburg. A strike also began in the Mercantile Marine in Emden, Bremen, Hamburg, and, and uh, Lübeck. Uh, and it called, uh, it called for by the Siemens Federation, which was under communist leadership as well. In uh, Berlin, metal workers went to action uh, 
250,000 in the capital and suburbs, of which 153,000 were in the trade unions. Worker, pres worker pressure forced the union to call a strike ballot. Results were overwhelmingly in favor of uh, let's fucking go. Uh, the second ballot included uh, non-members and was even more in favor. In the end, uh, a, a strike call went out to the largest firms comprising collected workforce, 90,000. Negotiations opened immediately. But on uh, July 10th, 150,000 were still on strike. The same day, employers signed for a wage increase, 9,800 marks for the last week of June to 12,000 for the first week of July. On the uh, one clause laid out the formation of a price index to allow for the adjustments uh, to be made accordingly with inflation. Employers wanted this kept secret for obvious reasons. The uh, results were quite visible, though. The building trade, then and then the woodworkers, uh, had to go at the Capitol not too long after. On the 12th of July, the explosion of economic strife prompted uh, De Rota Fauna to uh, publish a call to the party. Drafted entirely by Brandler, it had been accepted on the 11th by a particularly surprised Zentrala. Uh, Brandler, was uh, alarmed by the, progr by the progress of reactionary elements in the country and uh, none too happy to hear of Wolfheim, a former leftist, who had defected just so he could meme about icing some pinkos. He actually said, she's the <laughs> communist. Like, oh, that, that fine. Was anyway, um, the appeal basically said the Cuneo government was about to collapse and that shit would get incredibly real incredibly fast. The French and Belgians uh, were, pro were promoting a separatist movement in the Rhineland and Bavaria was ready to secede and just go bonkers with fascist nonsense. <laughs> uh, Nazis, true to form, were preparing for civil war. Uh, it would be after the harvest against workers uh, Saxony and Thuringia, where uh, Stockton's were, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, I wrote not on some cop shit for once and crossed it out and wrote, allowing it to occur so they wouldn't have to do the dirty work themselves. Fucking cowards. Um, but much like any shit show, it was unscheduled for uh, as of yet with any of the interested parties and was presumed to just be inevitable eventually. Uh, the idea was to rope in non-party people and sock dims into this so that they wouldn't be uh, colossally fucked, basically. Uh, the, the same issue announced the declaration of uh, July 29th as uh, anti-fascist day, which was also based, uh, um, and it was to uh, organize demonstrations. On anti-fascist day, the press did a big old fucko and called the demonstrations a declaration of war and proof the communists were preparing to do a full civil war, a whole one. What, uh, versus a half civil war? <laughs> Yeah. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I had to make that joke. Just a little civil war as a treat. <laughs> as a treat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just a side order of food. Um. <laughs> I mean, we're the meeting party this, but this shit is just like, I think it's kind of a little hard to fathom just how like grave this shit was. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Not I mean, this the, was literal, this was a literal life and death struggle. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we like, I, I just want to make sure that like, we're, it's, you know, we're not actually having a laugh here. <laughs> like, these are, yeah. you know, sometimes we make kind of some, some offhand jokes, but, you know, we're discussing a serious topic and we do. Oh, Yeah. Like, I'm oh, not chastising yeah. anybody here. I'm just saying that, you know, we're just trying to inject a little levity into the conversation, but we don't, you know, we, we have to acknowledge that this is a very, you know, um, rough period of history. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, what I personally, I mean, this is just my personal style, but I like, you know, talking about interesting, you know, 
it, a high it, a high IQ, uh, you know, history shit. But I also like making dick jokes at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's mostly okay on my channel, I guess. Yeah, I... Anyway, on with the show, friends. Okay. Anyway. The party, pre the party press issued denials, but uh, shit was still pretty squirrely. So you know, shrug. Um, more than just communists showed up for their demonstrations, though. So there's that. On July 23rd in Frankfurt on Main, uh, a joint demonstration by the Sock Dems and the KPD accosted bourgeois-looking passerbys and made them uh, carry signs and shout slogans. <laughs> And they forced shops to close. Mm. But um, the president of Hanover, Gustav Noska, uh, used uh, this as an excuse to ban the demonstrations in his state on the 29th. Damn. Hash, uh, ha um, uh, hashtag so much for the tolerant left. <laughs> Just taking right. away the free uh, freedom of speech. No more frozen peaches. Nope. <laughs> They're gone. Not even canned. Raided the Not entire walk-in freezer. There are no more <laughs> frozen peaches. Your ice cream will have to do without. <laughs> um. Anyway, init initialize leftist infighting.exe. <laughs> then Rollo began uh, to host uh, squabbles over the root board. Rondler had a proposition, an intermediate solution, if you will. Fucking centrist. He proposed to maintain the slogan and demonstrate where they had not been banned or where authorities just didn't have the power to stop them. The demonstrations would be protected by the proletarian hundreds. Doesn't, doesn't that name just give you shivers? Great. It's um, it's an awesome name. It's also a really nice counter, like counter, uh, whatever the right word is. I can't. I'm not struggling with words here. But there was a a reactionary, like kind of monarchist slash fascistic grouping in uh, Russia called the Black Hundreds, uh, and mm -hmm. they would do all kinds of nasty shit, like pogroms against uh, you know Jews and other national minorities. Um, but it's, I guess it's so, the proletarian hundreds is uh, a nice uh, uh, counter ca counterbalance to that, I guess. Appropriation. I don't know. <laughs> it's nice. It's a good term. Um, it sounds bad. Fisher believes it does. It really does. I, I, this, it, 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 it sounds amazing. Uh, Fisher believed that if the party were to submit, the workers would lose faith, and uh, if the Berlin demonstration uh, and the and the workers would lose faith, if the Berlin demonstration didn't commence, Berlin police under Serving were nothing to scoff at. Communists were less less influential uh, than sock dems in Berlin. Rondler correctly assumed the danger to be uh, heightened by the possibility of a. Uh, uh, proletarian hundreds commanders uh, being baited into trap. Basically, only do a Berlin demonstration if party leaders could ensure an overwhelming show of force could be presented. The irony of which was not lost on anyone in this discussion. Fisher was pissed. So much so that she called Brandler a fascist and an adventurist. Uh, Brandler backed off and proposed a protest of the prohibition itself, and this was just rejected outright. Discourse is forever. Yeah, as I uh, often say on Twitter, uh, <laughs> the only discourse I want is discourse right on out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, hold on. I lost my place. Let me find it. Okay. That would be right here, I think. Yeah. I should have numbered these. All right. The press waxed on for what seems like ages about a Bolshevik peril, which is an awesome band name, band name for anyone who wants to take it. Um, oh, yeah. They said the, the communists would stage a push 
the communists decided not to do that for obvious reasons mentioned previously. Uh, Brandler took the situation appropriately seriously and consulted with the ECCL for advice. The situation, trademark, in Moscow was hectic, to say the least. The 12th Congress of the Communist Party just ended. The first one without Lenin, whose last article appeared on the 6th of February, and he was left completely paralyzed after another stroke. It was bad. Um, the, politi the, the political bureau was having a, a time of sorts with economic issues. Uh, Trotsky proposed industrialization with planning, to which everyone just kind of went, nah. <laughs> Against him was the Troika, uh, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Stalin who had been uh, general secretary since 1922. The differences between the Troika and Trotsky were, uh, weren't really aired out until later on, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, Lord. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Nightmare <laughs> Alpha, you're right. F's in chat for Lenin. F's in chat for Lenin. <laughs> Yeah, Lenin, so Lenin, uh, just as a quick aside here, Lenin dies, I believe, in 24, um, but his political life is effectively over by 19, kind of sometime in 1922. His health is really um, taking a turn for the worse, and he's not writing nearly as much as he did Um and he's not an old man either. I think he died in his fifties. Um, yeah. Anyhow, yeah, just a note there. Uh, Lenin dies in I think nineteen twenty four, and uh, yeah, but he had been more or less out of commission for at least a, a year or so before that because of his. Uh, Wikipedia. He had strokes. He had some strokes. Wikipedia. Wikipedia says that uh, Lenin died on January 21st, 1924, at the age of 53. Okay, yeah. So he was really not that old. Not really, no. Yeah, but anyhow, I, as I said, he was pretty much out of commission, at least since sometime in 1922, I believe. <clears throat> For the most part. Right. Anyway. So uh, Bronler's telegram ended up only being seen by Radek and Finn, uh, uh, Radek and Finn Kusenin. Uh, Radek echoed the sentiment of uh, against, form, uh, against forcing a struggle. Uh, Trotsky, who was on holiday, refused to weigh in for lack of information. Zinoviev and Bukharin said, uh, defying the ban was necessary. Stalin disagreed, saying that temporary retreat was a better option. Um, Radek telegraphed Brandler on the 26th, advising against the demonstrations on the 29th, citing the possibility of a trap uh, being the main reason. Uh, so plans were changed. Demonstrations became indoor meetings, except in regions where state suppression was least likely to occur. Uh, the meetings were some biggins, though. Zentrala patted itself on the back in the, uh, for, and I wrote, uh, not getting everyone killed and crossed it out and wrote foiling the counter revolutionaries. Um, at the beginning of August, there was an uneasy understanding that cool heads and not adventurism were needed. This was heavily juxtaposed against the very urgent situation surrounding the communists. Um, on the 29th of July, however, a special conference by the Sockdoms was held. It, uh, which in which Paul Levy uh, and uh, Kurt Rosenfeld and Kurt Rosenfeld attended, along with Dismann and uh, Max Ulrich, both leaders of metal workers unions. Levy organized it and spoke to the success, spoke to the successes of the communists and the and I quote unpardonable blunders of the SPD. <laughs> <laughs> this shade is Jesus. Um, he also took it upon himself to say what uh, we were all thinking, heck, reformism. He also said the communists were close to winning a majority. Radek insisted on avoiding, on, uh, on avoiding fatalism. Randler repeated similar sentiments to his earlier position of uh, uh, martial theatrics. Fisher called this opportunism. Hugo Urban's uh, took 
or Urbans took uh, umbrage with the slogan, Fisher and Urbans abstain from voting. Bradler took this personally. Um, <laughs> August 8th saw a meeting of the Reichstag. Uh, Kuna's speech, which was interrupted by communist deputies, called for sacrifices, uh, economies, and uh, work, and appealed for a vote of confidence. Stockdens called for a postponement of the discussion, and it was granted. Wilhelm Koenig, KPD spokesman, shouted, Down with Kuno! This is the cry we hear from every side, which, as you can tell, was pretty bad. Um, uh, August 9th saw the debate resumed and the hall besieged by workers' delegations. In Chimnitz, 150,000 called for Kuno's resignation. August 10th saw, uh, saw what does that say? Oh, a vote of confidence. Conan hauled off and called for revolution. At dawn, a strike in all the shops of Berlin uh, of, of the Berlin Metro uh, began. Printers ceased printing banknotes. Siemens and Borsig stopped work. Berlin plants echoed the demand for Kuno's re resignation. In Hamburg, there was a total strike in the shipyards. Demonstrations were held in uh, Krefeld uh, and uh, uh, Aachen, and uh, Police, yeah, you uh, got that right. They... Huh? You got Aachen right. Oh, good. Huh. I, I, I was taking a chance on that one, I felt like. Um, police did what they did, what they do best and uh, murdered people. Uh, August 10th saw a meeting held by the com uh, Commission of Trade Unions. Independent Stockton and uh, Communist Party reps were invited. The problem was whether or not the trade unions would support the strike. So if they did, basically, Kuno was hit. In his place, probably revolution, basically. Uh, sock Dems disagreed, because of course they fucking would. In the end, uh, the goddamn Sock Dems ruined, the, ruined it. The unions got scared and sided against the KPD proposal. proposal. August 11th saw shootings in Hanover, Lubeck, uh, Naroda, and... And uh, at 10 o'clock in the halls of Nu, Velta uh, Klims Fustela, uh, delegates uh, to the factory council showed up with cars and motorbikes and little red flags. The police didn't do anything this time. Uh, Grotha proposed a three-day general strike with a uh, little debate along with a nine-point program. Uh, immediate dismissal of the Kuno government. Uh, formation of a workers and peasants government. Requisition of foodstuffs uh, and their fair distribution under the control of workers' organizations. Immediate recognition of the Workers' Control Committee. Lifting of the ban of the proletarian hundreds. Immediately uh, uh, fixing the minimum wage to 60 gold fennings. Immediate hiring of the unemployed into productive work. Ending of the emergency ban on demonstrations and immediate liberation of workers jailed for political offenses. At the same time as this, the Sognams fucked everything up again by agreeing to bail out the bourgeoisie again. And shit pretty much fizzles out there for a little bit. Uh, with a big, I told you so, from Raddick to put a bow on everything. The KPD announces an interruption to the struggle, but not a conclusion. Things only get worse from here. And that's where my notes end. That's a great way to end. <laughs> <laughs> and thing I I I have been saying for a while on this stream that you can pretty much insert the phrase uh and then an enormous shit show ensued. You can pretty much ins insert that phrase to like any part of this history and have it be more or less correct. Either that or and the so stems fucked up. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then the soap dems did cop shit. Pretty much. Um, cough fry core cough. Yeah. Uh, R.I.P. <laughs> Carl and Rosa. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, oh, speaking of, I wanted to make a quick plug um, for this amazing book, which I got from uh, Haymarket um, called The Living, Fra uh, the Living Flame, 
which is, uh, the subtitle is The Revolutionary Passion of Rosa Luxemburg by Paul LeBlanc. Um, it's a collection of essays written by LeBlanc about Rosa uh, from the last, basically, I think like 20 years or so. Anyway, it's fantastic. Uh, Comrade mm. Rosa, amazing, um, brilliant uh, e economist, uh, brilliant revolutionary, uh, Jewish communist anti-fascist martyr. Uh, there's nothing not to like about her. <laughs> um, she had some, she had some, uh, some really interesting polemical exchanges with Lenin, but, uh, Lenin, uh, you know, uh, famous for his, uh, epic dunkings was, uh, despite his disagreements with her, uh, regarded, he, he called her an eagle. So, uh, you know, they even helped. Lenin saw the brilliance of Rosa Luxemburg. Oh, yeah. No, and they were like, despite a lot of their disagreements, they were fundamentally on the same page about a lot of things, and they were uh, friends with each other. In fact, um, Rosa, this is just a little anecdote, but Rosa's cat Mimi apparently really didn't like men for the most part. Um, <laughs> And apparently one time Lennon was over at her um, abode and the cat actually liked Lennon. Um, <laughs> because, and Lennon is kind of, of one of the many things he's famous for is his uh, love of uh, kitties. There's all, all kinds of classic uh, photos and portraits of Lennon with his uh, cats and uh yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's just an interesting. Oh, yeah. uh, was he a uh, um, uh... <laughs> Cud cuddly commie? <laughs> nice. <laughs> I did not know that. All cats are beautiful. <laughs> All cats are most definitely beautiful. All right. Um. So now that we have actually summarized all of our uh, sections, we are we've been going at for about an hour and a half now. So. Um, I'm still, I'm happy to keep this going. Uh, we're having a good time. It seems like, uh, I don't want to keep anybody past their allotted time for this, but, um, Oh, yeah. I usually, oh, I usually stream for like three hours, so okay. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Uh all right. I just yeah, want to respect everyone's um, time and all uh, that. Oh, also, um, either chat, uh, feel free. I'm sure uh, my co-hosts will agree. Uh, we're open to your questions. Oh, yes, um, absolutely. Also, Quiet But Louder uh, has a question. Was that cat a uh, meowxist lenyanist? Oh, my God. <laughs> uh. I don't know. Maybe his name was Chairman Meow. No, it was me. It was Mimi. Oh, what? Ah! <laughs> uh, cat's name was Mimi. I'm sorry. That is never not a good pun, Chairman Meow. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah. Um. I think we have. There's a lot to discuss today. So. Um, oh yeah. I'll give all of you uh ample time to um kind of reflect on this uh chapter selection and say what you think was stood out to you what you thought was uh particularly important um and you know maybe questions that came up for you either you know things that you thought were weird or hard to understand or maybe just like curious to learn more about um, that sort of thing so i actually don't uh, it, I hope you don't mind if I actually go right now, um, oh, cause no, I okay. actually had been thinking about this. Go ahead. Um, yeah. I, Take I think line. it's really, I think it's really important that we point out, uh, the Nazi party had active government collaboration from pretty much its founding. Yes. I, I I think that's very important uh, for people to remember is that, you know, uh, is, you know, these people didn't just, you know, like 
friggin', you know, rise by themselves or whatever. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, Hindenburg was the one who appointed Hitler as chancellor. So I think it's really important, you know, that part of the reason why they were so successful or probably a large part of the reason is because of active collaboration by the uh, by the ruling class, by the bourgeoisie uh, who were legitimately threatened by the communists. Mm hmm. Oh, and you know, uh, I, I, I'm some sometimes very kind of hesitant around this term because it frequently kind of gets aimed at me or people, uh, people like me, uh, which is the term red brown alliance. And I think that the real danger of so-called red brown alliances, I think it is very real. I just I'm very careful about how I talk about it. I think that it's manifest in uh in how the soak dems uh collaborated with the nazis and how um kind of the there were seeds of this from the very beginning of, of um kind of the collapse of the second international and the um the the war vote because uh you know the the idea that well we can make you know socialism and nationalism, you know, uh, a, a unitary thing, um, which is totally antithetical to the whole Marxist uh, foundation of it. Um, the proletariat have no nation. Yes, or you know, as, sound uh, familiar. Yeah, Eugene Debs' words: uh, "I have no nation, or uh, no no nation or flag to die for. I am a citizen of the world, or something like that." Oh I well, I die for the red and black flag. And uh, yeah, I don't know about Eugene Debs. I uh, yeah, I I think, uh, I think he's his, I, his intent is, you know, obviously I think aimed more at the at uh, imperialism and and capital. oh yeah i yeah. was i that sort of it, I mean, that, that sort was, of flag I, in that sort of sense i think that's i i really hope it i hope it was clear i was joking oh, okay yeah all right um anyhow but you know uh and i think i think what's been just really clarifying for me about reading um this section particularly on kind of how the nazis came into being is that it really demystifies them in a in a in a very important way because i think especially the way that we are taught about nazis and nazism in the united states and in the west more generally maybe less true in you know europe but i can't speak to that um but certainly how we're taught about uh nazism in the united states is very narrow and very like well they are all really racist for some reason, and <laughs> and then and then they killed a bunch of, of of Jews and disabled people and and yada yada. Um, <laughs> like there's no political that. context given to it. There, it's, yeah, and then the you um, and then the, the, the freedom loving the horseshoe theory, the horseshoe theory oh. is actually really integral to how they're portrayed as just being kind. Of, oh, it's just. The, you know, it's just as bad as the communists, whereas, you know, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, 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 that's not where we're going with that. Um, oh my God, no. But, um, <laughs> no, I was, I was playing into the joke of horseshoe theory. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to avoid that though, because I'm thinking that it's in this context, it's very important to how nazism and communism are equated in the american education system um, which, which i think is absolutely false and horrible in every way mm -hmm. um but anyhow uh that's one that is if it's even brought up yeah if it even yes that's right if it's even brought up um but yeah like nazism i think overall in the american education system is really kind of referred to in this like um you know, nebulous, like, oh, well, you know, uh, that's, uh, they kind of like came out of nowhere, like, or there, it's just, there, there's not much substance to like, okay, what were the material conditions that caused yeah. a movement like the Nazis to have any kind of social currency? Um, you know, it's not like Germany just woke up one day and decided to be extra racist you know 
Like there was, I think it's what's really important from from the study of this book is that we're we're learning that there were already, you know, throughout German society, uh, across the political spectrum, uh, various shades of racism and other forms of national chauvinism. Um, and you know, I think the real lesson for today in our in our current movement is you ignore that at your peril. And I think that's really like our the yeah. Thing that, the thing that we rail against when we talk about, you know, the dirtbag left and like. Oh, I was gonna say like orange man bad, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Social like social patriotism of the liberals, you know. I think that there's an element of that in how you know liberals just fixate on traitor Trump, traitor Trump. Everything is about Trump. Moscow, Trump. Mitch. Moscow, Mitch. Traitor Trump. Right. It's oh all God. kind of. Oh, oh remember uh, Lenin, in... Remember Leningrad, Lindsay, and I'm oh, like, for God's sake. Um, oh, the, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Or... Hashtag geo. Uh, is that hashtag G. Uh, Wait, hashtag GOP can't communists. That was that. That oh was an God. actual thing that trended on Twitter. Was hashtag GOP communists. I long for death's tender embrace. Somebody, you trying to say something? Oh yeah. Remember, sorry. everyone, socialism is when the government does stuff, and the more stuff the government does, the more socialisty it is. <laughs> Izzy, you wanted to say something? Go for it. Uh, Simba was trying to say something earlier. Oh. I, I wasn't trying to say anything. Um, oh, so oh, it's all good. Sorry, like oh. Simba, it is really hard to hear you. So I, if you need to get my attention, like maybe like wave wave your arms around or something. I'll try to. I'll try to. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, anyhow, um, yeah, no. So I think the your real lesson is you know you ignore you know, national chauvinism in your movement <laughs> really at your peril. Um, and I think it is, you know, that's the same kind of shit that we see today with the dirtbag left. And, um, you know, I think a real atrocious example of it was uh, famed uh, dirtbag leftist Angela Nagel published that article, um, The Case Against Open Borders, and it's just like oozing with oh. just the worst kind of chauvinism. Um, oh, no. And it's disguised in this kind of quasi Marxist language uh, and like uses like a bunch of decontextualized Marx quotes to justify like, here's why strong borders are good, actually. And I think that, you know, uh, cleaning, I, 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 t I take less. You know, I, I think there's kind of maybe a fixation, maybe at least among kind of online leftists of, well, we need to, you know, convert the reactionaries. And I, I really, I think I, this is my spicy take maybe, but I think that's wasted breath. I think that, you know, really the, the terrain that we need to be navigating is to be, you know, calling out uh, and not just like calling out, but like materially fighting chauvinism in our own communities and our own spaces, because you know, that's not a viable political line. Simba, go. <laughs> Can't hear you at all. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say that in the United States, that often um, manifests as what Jay Sakai would call settlerism, which isn't necessarily uh, like pride in your country or whatever rather mm -hmm. than like like displacing the blame in places where it doesn't belong typically uh to disenfranchised groups or acting like um you're you're being objective with things when really like you're you're um hmm, hmm, how do i put this uh like re like refusing to to lend a voice to the more disenfranchised uh, members of a group Mm -hmm. uh is a settlerism that's something to look out for just anything that would uh distract us from like the actual material goals mm -hmm. um so yeah check check out the that book at some point yes uh maybe that's you know something that we'll cover on a future stream or maybe i'll do a video about it or something mm -hmm. uh settlers the myth of the of the white proletariat by 
Jay Sakai. Um, but yeah, no, it's a like, good book for its overall framework. All right. Not the best yeah. at like actual history, but I think it does yeah, give I an overall frame. That. And I couldn't disagree with any. Uh, I agree with everything uh, Young Simba said. Yeah. So I, I think yeah, the, the common thread of kind of national chauvinism and i think specifically in the context of you know the u.s and like australia and um you know israel as like settler, specifically settler colonial states kind of um makes those questions like actually really pu pushes them to the forefront of of political struggle in like a way that i think um you know communists of all stripes uh, ignore at their peril and uh, you know, really jeopardize the movement, frankly. Can't hear you, Chucky. Chucky, mm -hmm. if you're trying to say something, I can't hear you. I wasn't. Oh, okay. I was trying to say something to chat, but I didn't want y'all to hear it. Because oh, okay. it, it was irrelevant to what you guys were saying. Oh, very well. Okay. And yeah. muting myself. All right. Um, but yeah, um, so, right, and I think kind of the underlying maybe, like, theoretical thread that we want to tease out here is that, like, if your socialism only extends to the border, then it isn't socialism, right? And, right. like, if your socialism is, uh, wrapped up in an American flag, it's not socialism. <laughs> Uh, you know, the New Deal, and I'm I, I'm having, my next video is coming out soon. I promise, I promise, I promise, I keep saying that. Um, the New Deal was not socialist by any measuring stick. In fact, a lot of facets of the New Deal were, in fact, um, uh, inspired by uh, private industry. For example, the Social Security Act uh, was modeled on private insurance so that's just just one example oh go ahead simba yeah i just wanted to say i mean i follow um uh what's his name michael moore on instagram and stuff just because like i follow a bunch of people that i don't like the opinions of just to like see what they're saying you know what i mean uh, uh -huh. like, I follow like CNN and MSNBC like on Twitter or whatever mm -hmm. just because like I want to know like if if I'm a normal person and I'm not you know like a super intense history nerd or whatever like what am I gonna see and uh, I think Michael Moore specifically posted a picture that was like death toll of Trump like 130,000 or whatever like horrible number of uh, you know COVID deaths as like the death toll for like Trump and then uh, Obama's for Ebola was like two or three or something like that. Um, so like he was counting like, look, like Obama had like two or three deaths due to like this pandemic and like uh, Trump has like this many or whatever. Um, but, and, and he did one of those as well for, I think around the time that Donald Trump drops uh, the largest non-nuclear bomb ever uh, in Afghanistan or whatever. And it was like a death toll of foreign wars or whatever. But, like, think about what's not being counted there. Not the number of deaths from imperialist wars, not the number of deaths from, from other illnesses or the lack of uh, health insurance or whatever, uh, not the number of deaths of migrants across the uh, southern border or anything. It's just, like, American deaths, you know, specifically of, like, people that, that are wanted, like, he wanted to count for, like, that particular message. Like, there was no kind of sense of internationalism. So, yeah, if it's not, like, an international thing, and if, if you're not, dire like, directing your effort at, you know, issues in every country and every continent of disenfranchised people, then, yeah, you're, you're not doing a leftism. You're doing a liberalism. You're doing, yeah, you're not, yeah, exactly. You're doing a liberalism but you're also specifically doing a li liberalism that's incredibly vulnerable to uh, fascist tendencies, right? I think, and that's what we're seeing here is this kind of, you know, any kind of concession to 
you know, the nationalism, and I think we're going to be very careful here about this term nationalism, the nationalism of, you know, capitalist, imperialist, settler countries is qualitatively, you know, very different from something like, say, black nationalism or indigenous nationalism, right? It, big, qualitative different, big qualitative differences between, you know, the nationalism of, of oppressor nations, oppress, oppressor states, and the nationalism of, of oppressed nations and oppressed, oppressed states and so on. Um, so, yeah, uh, Izzy, you, ha, do you want to weigh in here? I've been kind of quiet for a minute. <laughs> Oh, I'm I just kind of zoned out of listening to y'all. I'm actually super tired. No, it's okay. <laughs> no pressure uh, if you don't have something to contribute right away. Oh no, no. And it's it's fine. Um, but I, I, I don't. Um no, I was just kinda of soaking it in. That's all right. Part red. Yeah. Part where I just kinda of learn stuff. Yeah, that's the goal of this whole this whole deal. Yeah, I I think it's also important that we need to realize that the governing structures, ba both back then and right now, are not going to help us one bit. In fact, they're probably going to fight us. And no matter how many concessions we get, we can't. Uh, we need to be. We need to ask for the world while. Uh, uh, we need to never stop our demand, uh, our ultimate demands until they're met. You know, yeah, we should work short term for uh, any reforms we can get, but never be satisfied and always uh, try to show a united front of, you know, as much of the working class as you can because solidarity is good. And Again, yeah, we uh, uh, we need to remember that uh, far right nationalists, fascists are going to be supported by the power structure more times than not, and you know we can never give them an inch. We need uh, we need to fight the fascists and then fight the capitalists and the imperialists and the racists and all the bad people. Yeah, so I just, um, this is, I guess, somewhat tangential, but it is also related, which is that, and this is a theme that I've kind of touched on in our previous um, discussions here, which is that I think it's it can be really tempting to look back on, like, revolutions or just historical events in general, um, but, like, revolutions, whether they were victorious or defeated, I think it's real easy as kind of, you know, his, historical, you know, students looking back on everything. And say, like, I think there's a real temptation to view their outcomes as inevitable. Um, and I think that there is, like, I think that my reading of Brouet's book here has really given me like a unique, I like, perspective on this which is that um um oh thank you uh nightmare alpha thanks for joining us we really appreciate folks yeah bye, -bye. Um, but yeah so reading this book is it's been really clear to me that like it's you know the the, the that they were up against incredible odds is is not in question um but you know it's also not entirely clear in all of the situations that things, you know, were, were inexorably tending to their defeat. Um, because oh, I'm of the firm belief that if the KPD and the Spartacist League never trusted in Ebert and the Social Democrats, that they probably could have won if they had kept on their course of fact, uh, uh, factor um, workers and soldiers councils, and kind of kept concentrating their power and not, you know, trying to trust the Socialists. Oh, and also they never seized any of the capitalist presses. That was that that was a big, uh, big mistake. But yes, I, I do agree well, that it was not inevitable. Well, yeah, and actually, this this what you just said ties into exactly what I what I wanted to 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 get at, which is that, and I think maybe I actually disagree to to an extent, which is that, um, you know, they really went hard on 
uh, being really like organically tied to the institutions of the working class. And, you know, they really went um, deep on factory councils. They had, you know, they prided themselves in having majorities in 2000 councils um, in 1922 or 23, I can't remember. But yeah, so they also experienced like this tremendous growth during the period of inflation um, because I think it's it's very clear that like throughout this text, what's been going on is that, you know, who's fighting shoulder to shoulder with the workers for their bread? The fucking KPD every time. They're the ones in the trenches, I mean, you know, so to speak, getting their hands dirty and, you know, organizing the the control commissions and all these things. And I think it's maybe a little bit unfair to say that they trusted the Sochdems too much, because I think they really, I think they, they, you know, they, they trusted them to be, tr they trusted them insofar they, as they knew they were treacherous and they knew that. Oh, I was talking about the Spartacist League. Oh, early. okay. Specifically the Spartacist League. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you that. Um, but yeah, like, I think they were, you know, especially the deeper that the crisis, the crises converged, like. I think no none of them had any illusions about especially the um the uh social democrat leadership. Um uh, I think that they were their policy of the united front especially was like geared towards okay well the social democrat leaders are you know scummy you know cop cop loving bootlickers but mo most people who you know are still members of the SPD are you know, being polarized in our direction, so we should be, you know, fighting right alongside them. There's no reason not to. Um, and I think just increasingly as the crisis deepens, I think that those contradictions become much more intense and inflamed. And that, yeah, and that a lot of like both the kind of right deviations and left deviations to use some of uh, the common terms um perhaps uh ac somewhat accurate but perhaps somewhat also ill-founded terminology uh i think result what even is a left communist right well yeah i mean it's like it's it's either the it's either you know it, it, it it's, it's a pejorative if you're if you're losing and it's it's a it's a it's a uh and it's a praise if you're winning right <laughs> um mm -hmm. anyway um but I think what I've been led to believe uh, uh, left communism involves at least to some extent a uh, knowledge of armchair. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hey, I will have you know, Anton Panikok is my favorite Marxist. Like, I'm not even kidding. So, um, but yeah, no, I think that, and I think this there's a quote from Radic, or maybe it's Zenobia, I can't remember offhand, but basically saying that both the so-called rightist and leftist deviations of, you know, the contradictions created from the United Front and it's, you know, trying to put it into practice were like both opportunist on the one hand and, you know, on the other hand, very adventurous. I think both things can be true. I think that, you know, those conditions, um, you know, pushed, push the you know push the party into that to that state of, of, of internal contradiction internal turmoil i think it. Would i mean i also like that there is a diversity i like that there was a diversity of thought oh yeah absolutely it was healthy yeah and like mm -hmm. i'm also hosting a study group on the russian revolution right now and i'm was you know also very struck by the level of kind of internal debate within um you know the the uh, Bolshevik circle and so on, and like how, for example, it was not until April of 1917 when um, you know Lenin uh, steers, you know, rearms the party with the, the the April theses that things really like start taking a turn. <laughs> but like it was, it's always just striking to me that you know, not just in the case of the Bolsheviks, but like in all these cases with, you know, communist parties all over is that there's this kind of liberal or like maybe like even reactionary 
I think it's 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 a re, it's a reactionary caricature that's uses liberal language that says that like oh communists are just like totalitarians and they don't tolerate disagreement and I was just like and like this has been really clear for, clear to me from reading the histories of these revolutions that like actually no the communists are frequently like very consistent practitioners of de- internal democracy um and they yeah, have not these to really there. intense and fruitful debates um, yeah, not to mention there's a lot of different types of communism. Right. Uh, there's there's you know the Leninist variety of communism. Uh, then you got uh, libertarian communism, left communism, council communism, and narco communism, which is what I love. All these uh, fun uh, commie ideologies that uh, all go under the label of uh, dirty, dirty red. Right. Well, and I mean, I guess what I'm getting at is that even with within those those tendencies in and of themselves, like within the the say the Leninist tendency, there's you know, or within a, even a within a you know a party like the KPD, like there's this um, you know internal this internal culture of debate, and I think that that's uh, and I, I I've been going on for a minute, so I'm gonna wrap up this thought and kind of pass things off back to you guys but um like one thing that i remember from the earlier chapters is that one of the things that the spartac the spartacists were really huge about was debate like they had this like very vigorous internal debate culture uh which the kpd very much inherited uh from them and yeah and like i gotta speak as somebody who's been in various um communist you know m- you know mostly marxist leninist style types of organization before like yeah there there's you know always spicy debate uh and it's actually some of the most like like re- interesting it's not just like shit flinging most of the time it's it's frequently very interesting and very like you know, debate is much more like fleshing out what the actual differences are, understand, you know, it's, it's kind of this, got this goal of mutual understanding, how are we going to move our organization forward and this, you know, t- taking this action or not taking this action or whatever, I think. Anyway, so that's, I'm, uh, I've gone on for a minute now, so I'm going to pass things back to you guys. If you have mm-hmm. thoughts, just go for it. I'm, I, I actually need to refill my water, so I'll be back. Oh, okay. <sighs> I also need to pee quickly. <laughs> so, Izzy. Yeah? What have you been up to? I climbed the mountain the other day. Like, no. how do you know how many miles it was, or? Uh, like it was more like there was a trail up the side of it. Oh, okay, got you. Oh, so yeah. it was like climbing, like, climbing, not like a hike. Oh no, 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 God, no. I'm not nimble enough for that. I'll die. <laughs> True. Well, that's that's awesome. Are you uh, like planning on doing that a lot, or? I mean, I got a GoPro, and I figured that would probably be of good use for it. So, nice. nice. Like, I like... figured. Huh? Oh, I was just gonna say, it seems like you're very into like. I I don't want like... to say survivaly type things, but like out. Oh no, that would be accurate, actually. Oh really? <laughs> got you. Got you. Yeah. No. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh. I ran into a, uh, I ran into a uh, trauma nurse there, and the conversation naturally went to like COVID nineteen, really, yeah. really interesting conversation, and I got it all on camera. Plus, the scenery up there is really yeah. nice, so I'm probably gonna do some nice like I don't know. Okay, I'm back. Oh yes, mm-hmm. Izzy, I saw the pictures from your. Uh, mountain trip on my on instagram is beautiful yeah it was really nice up there uh 
this is the first time I've like in a long time I've been somewhere that doesn't immediately smell like diesel. <laughs> All right. Um, so we are at the two hour mark and I uh I must admit I'm I'm very I'm a very tired girl. So I would like mm-hmm. to go ahead and kind of wrap things up here. Um I'm gonna um uh don't worry everyone will have a chance to kind of get their last words in and plug yourselves and all that um but uh, i just wanted to kind of uh start uh putting a bow on this puppy um so let's see if thank you folks who who've been turning in tuning in um if you'd like to support the show i'm gonna um give you a link here i'm put it up on the screen uh head over to my uh, Patreon at patreon.com slash a world to win. Um, and you can uh, help uh, support the show financially. Um, I also do uh, videos other than this on my, on my YouTube channel. I do, um, you know, history videos, political theory videos, that sort of thing. Uh, so if you'd like to see more of those, uh, please uh, support me in that way. Uh, and if you can't support me financially, uh, totally get that. That's fine. You can follow me on Twitter uh, at a world to win one. Um, and of course, like, comment, um, sh- subscribe, share my videos, all that good stuff. Um, so I'm going to switch back over to the main screen here. And uh, for those of you who are f- maybe uh, following along with us, we are in the uh book we are on page we are starting with next time we're going to be doing chapters 39 through 42 uh starting with uh chapter 39 preparing the insurrection which is on page 755 um and i am uh if you need a i'm not gonna i can't i don't have access to it right this second but uh if you need a copy of a digital copy of the book uh hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I can give you a, a digital copy. Um, or I... um, oh, or yeah. you can uh, go Ooh. into my Discord under the stream chat. Uh, I have a copy. The stream right. chat, yeah. text chat, my Discord. Yeah, I, don't, I just oh, don't no. have access to the link right this second. So, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, this book is uh, pretty expensive to get your hands on otherwise. Uh, so PDF of it mm-hmm. is uh, nice to have. Um, so we'll be reading those four chapters next time, and uh, we are going to hopefully uh, have our esteemed uh, friend uh, Labor Kyle and uh, our other special guest, uh, recurring guest Professor Axel Fairschultz, again with us mm-hmm. next time. Uh, Associate Professor of awesome. History at uh, SUNY Potsdam. Um, also. Uh, I, I believe grew up in East Germany. I uh, have to, can't, don't quote me on that. I don't remember offhand, but um, it's a great, uh, great, great guy to have around. It's a great comrade. Um, so I was just going to solicit kind of closing thoughts from everybody. Uh, and then y'all can, uh, at the end of that, maybe, you know, plug yourselves, plug your Twitter, your Twitch, or whatever you want to promote on here. Um, in whatever order you guys think is prudent. Oh, okay. Well, um, I guess you could follow me on Twitter at, at Izzy underscore the underscore Fox, uh, F-A-W-K-E-S, like, you know, the, the, the famous terrorist. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I have recently changed my YouTube channel's name to that, but it's linked on my Twitter, so like it's pretty easy to find all of it. Um, yeah, yeah, I've got the same name on pretty much every time, so I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. Uh, I am. Trekkie69, uh, wig-wearing extraordinaire Twitch streamer. Um, <laughs> I stream at twitch.tv slash Trekkie69. Um, at least for the next month, um, I stream every day from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern. 
unless they're special events like this where I stream other times. <laughs> uh, I'm Young Simba. You can find me on everything at Young Simba. I'm going to come out with a video eventually. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so good. Um, all right. Well, um, yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming and participating. And uh, I'm always very grateful to my co-hosts for, uh, you know, taking time out of their lives to uh, do the hard work that is working through this absolute monster of a of a text. Um, uh -huh. And you know, because uh, we do, we, we don't, uh, you know, this is this is something that we do for the um, for the cause, right? So. Uh, a uh, very difficult thing to do and a lot of a lot of time goes into it so we really appreciate everyone who keeps tuning in uh it really means a lot to us um because of the kind of hard work that we put into it excuse me um but yeah um we will catch you in two weeks it will be uh july 26th at 3 30 p.m uh pacific time slash 6 30 p.m uh eastern time uh as usual we do this uh bi-weekly unless you know something comes up and you know we need to cancel or reschedule or whatever um but yeah and let me know uh either dm on twitter or leave a comment or whatever and let me know uh what other books that you'd like me to cover uh you like us to dissect together you know that could be you know other big heavy books like this they could be shorter books uh whatever you think is uh worth our time so yeah thanks to everyone for tuning in and we will see you in a couple of weeks bye